You could go to five or six thousand videos, or just one. That's right, we're making a big old video that's gonna be your one-stop shop for the class changes between the old and the new version of the player's handbook. My thoughts on them, and guess what? If you're curious as to why these things have changed, I sat down with the Jeremy Crawford, the lead rules designer of Dungeons & Dragons, to ask the hard-hitting questions about the changes coming with these books. Hello, Jeremy. Great to meet you. What are books? Favorite color? What time is it? Got change for a dollar? Where am I? What would you do if when you okay so he said yes would go? Would you still love me? If I was a worm? Were you silent or were you silenced? So... But in all seriousness, I did get an interview with the guy, and I did ask him some questions about this book that is about to drop. So grab a snack and a little drink, because this is an extra long installment of Tip of the Hat, All Changes Edition. Okay, so groundwork real quick before we get into the meat of it. Wizards of the Coast did not sponsor this video. They offered me an interview with Jeremy Crawford to ask questions about the book, but they did not give me money for this. I do not have like an affiliate code with this. They're not controlling what I see in this video. This is all beamed directly from my little brain to your little brain. Secondly, what makes me qualified to do this? Well, I know how to read, brag, and I got the PDF of the PHB way early, like super early. I already made a video on how tieflings are gonna change in the new book, and they did give me the full book for that, so I've been compiling this list for a minute. If I miss something, I am sorry. I tried my very best. Don't be mad at me. I've read both of these books like twice already just for this. It was hell. And thirdly, and finally, why? Why care? Well, I ask myself every day. Well, to tell you the truth, this whole new book business is scary and confusing. Oh lord, has it been confusing. Is this an edition change? What happens then? Most people came into the hobby with 5e and fell in love with it then. What does this mean for them? Well, let me spoil that for you right now and tell you that this is not an edition change. This feels like an update to 5e. If you know how to play 5e, you know how to play this. You don't have to learn anything new. This does not change the big strokes of 5e design, but rather it updates them with a mix of stuff that most tables already homebrew in, new stuff that works well, new stuff that works less well, new stuff that whether you like it or not is a matter of your personal opinion, and that's pretty much it. This is not like 3.5e, or rather it's more like 3.5 than a jump from 4th to 5th. So if that got you stressed, which I know, it stressed me. It's gonna be fine. The thing is even retrocompatible with old content. It's the Game Boy Advance of D&D. It's gonna be okay. Okay, that's enough preamble. Let's get into the changes. This video is gonna be a flyover glance to all class changes. It's so that you know what's going on without watching 27 videos on whether class good or class bad. It's an easy to digest summary of what the big changes to classes are. And I made sure to mark video chapters for you in case you wanna skip along. Whenever I have an opinion, I'll be sure to yap. And whenever something we're talking about is related to a question I asked Jeremy Crawford, he'll come in and yap in turn. They gave me 15 minutes with him, so don't expect him constantly. Also, I'll be referring to the old version of the PHB as old book and the new version as new book. I'm great at names. Okay, changes. Lots of reading. Woohoo! Reading! Uh, okay, this is not gonna work. I'm gonna tag team this. Editing a video of this length without any sort of B-roll is gonna be a nightmare. I need a face just for this one. Human familiar! Human familiar! Hi. Okay, I read the old book and the new book twice, simultaneously, for this. So my brain has turned to oatmeal. Bon appetit. There are massive changes before classes that you're gonna wanna know about, so I'm gonna go through them really quick. Don't worry, I'll make it relatively painless. As much as I can. First up, race. Race? Race has changed a lot, RTCA icons. Race has changed so much that it's not called race at all. Your little blob person is composed of an origin, which is itself composed of your race and your background put together. <laughs> to make it clear, they both are here. Your background and your race make up your origin. You choose a background and you choose a race and that is an origin. Or should I say, you choose a species. The word for race has changed to species. I reported on this on my... <laughs> Reported on this. What do I think I am? I talked about this in my tiefling video and there were enough questions about it in order for me to Ask Jeremy Crawford why they did it. When I did my video on tieflings I got a lot of questions as to why the change from race to species I assume it's because of the connotations behind the word race 
Is that a wrong assumption? Are there other reasons behind the change? For a number of years in our books, we have been explaining that whenever we used the previous term, that we were using it in the sense of the English expression, human race. And we realized since we kept having to explain it, how about we pick a term that we don't have to keep explaining? And so <laughs> as a part of the revision process, we decided now is the perfect time to change terms to something that's some simply a better description of what's going on. So this was really a chance for us to land on something that we felt required less explanation and that would also fit better in our new approach to a character's backstory. Because in the new player's handbook, we now, after you choose your class, we ask you to consider your character's origin. We present your origin as having two main pieces your background, which is what you did and where you were before you became an adventurer, and then your species, which of course is all about where you came from in terms of your ancestry. What do I think of this change? I think nothing. I barely think, period, but I think a negative amount about this change. I guess it's good to kind of like dispel the sort of racial determinism that they're worried about, and I see why, but I feel like they did that already by decoupling ability scores from races, so. Okay, I mean, it doesn't hurt. My only take here is that the word species is, uh, I use it, uh, uh, ugly. It's ugly, it's sort of like sci-fi coded, it feels like it doesn't mesh with the tone and genre of D&D. You might as well call them macroorganisms. But you know a term that feels just as bad and just as ill-fitting as species? Subrace. And, you know, it is just as bad at it, and then we got used to it and we used it, so... The same thing will happen to species, and ultimately, who cares? For what it's worth, they use the word lineage to refer to, like, the different type of tieflings, and they don't use this word again, so I wish they had just used lineage instead of species. I just feel like I have to say species, like, in a nasally voice as I push up my glasses. Like, why not lineage or legacy or something like that, you know? Ultimately, though, this doesn't matter, and I do not care. Like, I refuse to pretend that this is a big issue. But if it is a big issue for you, congrats that it changed, or sorry that it changed. Moving on, backgrounds. Backgrounds are massive now. And first of all, backwards compatibility rules. They said that these books would be backwards compatible with all 5e books, and we'll get to that, but I didn't even think of backgrounds when they said that, and they did. They did make it backwards compatible. You can use any old backgrounds, and there are rules to transform them into these new backgrounds. And that's great. Okay, moving on to actual changes. First up, backgrounds give you ability score increases instead of races, or species. Now, I have stuff to say about this, but let's see what Jeremy says about the topic. In Tasha, we saw the alternate rule of giving the choice of where to put ability scores to the player, but here we see it's been added to backgrounds. While I understand the shift in design for a character to be less defined by the intrinsic characteristics of their biology and more by their lived experiences, why walk back the Tasha change? The optional rule in Tasha's Cauldron was a great option for people who wanted to tinker with the rules as they were, but now with our chance to deal with the whole game holistically in the new player's handbook, we really wanted to move those ability score adjustments to where we felt they belonged narratively, which is your decision about how have you spent your years before you became a fighter or a wizard. So we wanted it to have a concrete effect on your character that you would feel for the rest of your character's career Career, whether you chose that your wizard was a soldier before becoming a wizard or an acolyte. We wanted background to have a bigger impact, but we also wanted to preserve some of the flexibility that that optional rule in Tasha's had, which is why the new backgrounds now give you three ability scores and you then choose which of the three you get a plus two in and which of the three you get a plus one in. Or if you don't want to make that choice, you can just decide I'm going for plus one in all three of them. Mm. And so we are really happy with where this rule landed because we're sort of getting the best of both worlds. You, you really get that sense of how much your background shaped you while also having a fair amount of flexibility. As for me, I like this much better. I like that your lived experience experience is the thing that determines if you're stronger or wiser or well learned or whatever. I think that's neat. I think that makes sense. Great. But, but I still like Tasha better. I like picking just whatever you want better. I understand that it might be like a little bit confusing to newcomers and I understand that it might feel hacky and like you're not making a strong choice as a game designer, but 
Ultimately, why can't I play a very smart pirate? A very well-learned pirate? What if I want the pirate background, but the plus two to intelligence, because I want to play a pirate wizard? If you have to tie ability scores to anything, I'm glad it's tied to backgrounds. But personally, I will still let my players just choose whatever. But now you know how backgrounds work, except no, you don't. Because now, backgrounds give you, get ready, a feat. A whole feat for every background. And some are some really good ones. Stuff like Alert, Magic Initiate, Healer. They are good feats. This is fun. It makes backgrounds way more relevant. It makes characters play very differently from the beginning. A plus. I love this change. Good. Okay, those are all the non-class changes I felt like you absolutely needed to know. On to the meat of this massive, massive video. Classes. Do I like them? Spoiler, I do. For most of them, keyword most, let's take a look at why. Since you're watching this video, I'll assume you're down with changes. So how about changing the way the game plays to make the game faster, easier to learn, and all about freedom for creativity and teamwork? What about a way to play where combat is fast and tense? Teamwork is rewarded. Magic is easier to pick up and more flavorful. Classes are not just revamped, but completely new ones are added. And all of this being 5e compatible? That's right, this is what Nimble is offering. And like way more than that, there's a lot of things on offer here. Nimble is a fast, tactical, and 5e compatible TTRPG all about eliminating the slog of general TTRPG play and getting to the good part. It's dessert first, second, and third without losing any of the good parts of modern TTRPG gaming. Especially nowadays where the hobby is back to trending towards rules heavy, Nimble aims to be easy to pick up, easy to teach, and easy to implement into existing games. You can play it by itself or adapt it into your ongoing 5e game. Some of the things that Nimble does away with that sound amazing to me, other than the ones I listed before, is stuff like instant initiative to get rid of that very fun step of waiting around for combat to start, or a completely new legendary monster system that is all about making it easy for the GM to run, down to even accounting for different party sizes. So if all of this sounds good, Nimble is right now, as we speak, on Backer Kit. It's the very first link in the description if you want to check it out. Thank you to Nimble for sponsoring this video, and now, back to ch-ch-ch-changes. Let me list the global changes first, the ones that affect all classes. Multiclassing is much, much more well accounted for. Each class gets its own dedicated text as to how you should multiclass in that class instead of a massive page of inexcrutable text. A plus, good change. Starting equipment has two options. It's either a weapon or gold. Pick the weapon. Spellcasters get suggestions for level one spells and cantrips. A plus, good for newcomers, easy, and you can also ignore this. At level 19, every class gets an epic boon feat. An epic boon is a specific type of feat that you can only pick when you can pick an epic boon. This video is already way too long. We're not getting into feats. You just know now that at 19, an epic boon happens. No one plays at 19. It's gonna be fine. Let's get into the classes. For our first class, let's go with... Alphabetical order. I didn't say it was exciting. Barbarian! I never get to be on camera for this long. What if I wore something to match the class I'm talking about? If you think this is low effort, I will remind you that it's July in Spain. Barbarians have changed a ton. The biggest change is being to their rage and to the reckless attack. And the rage change is so insane that you're not gonna believe it. So let me start with the reckless attack one. In the old book, the one that you know about, when you did a reckless attack, you get advantage on that attack, but everyone else gets advantage on attacks against you. In new book, you can choose to do that, or, or you can choose to go so reckless, go stupid, go crazy so hard that you inflict 1d10 force damage and, and inflict forceful blow or hamstring blow. What are those? Those are maneuvers, like the battle master fighter. They gave the barbarian maneuvers or like a version of them. It's amazing! They're not tied to superiority dice. You just get to do them every time you make a reckless attack and you choose forceful blow or whatever the maneuver is. It's great! And you gain new maneuvers or whatever they call them as you level up. These go from lowering speed to pushing someone 15 feet to imposing disadvantage on the next saving through a creature make so you can set up your nerds. I mean, your spellcasters. It's great! Okay, the second biggest change, and this one is weird, is to rage. Rage now lasts for 10 minutes. Why? Why? Because you're supposed to rage out of combat and in combat. Out of combat rage. When you rage, you make acrobatics, intimidation, perception, stealth, and survival checks with your strength. I guess you're perceiving through your pecs of rage. This sounds insane, but I think they're going for a sort of like blind, rageful determination. Like you're the Terminator looking for Sarah Connor so you can snap her neck. And you use perception for that. It's a sort of like Kratos sort of rage, but like new Kratos, not 
old Kratos. That's the old Barbarian. As for subclasses, big changes. Path of the Berserker, which is, to me, the worst subclass in all of 5e. I mean, to me, but I'm right about this. They changed it, so... They agree, is now way better by virtue of giving you a massive boost to damage and keeping it very simple for newbies. Path of the Totem Barbarian has changed names, which... Good, just good. We're not gonna get into that, just... Good change. It's now called Path of the Wild Heart, which I like better, and they also nerf Bear, which... God didn't need it, it's still good, but... It did need a nerf. And finally, Path of the Zealot is now way more paladin coded, down to getting like a paladin form at capstone, but still keeping the whole flavor of like, too angry to die. And making your DM cry, because you just won't go down. The biggest issues for barbarians to me, and I talked about this in the video, is that they are fantastic for introducing D&D combat, but they can get very boring very fast once you actually understand combat, and that they have nothing to do outside of combat. The two changes to barbarians address this, and I don't know why I'm playing Koi, I absolutely love it. I am so, so happy with this, specifically the maneuvers. God, the maneuvers, I'm so happy with maneuvers! It gives just enough choice to make barbarians actually fun to play at higher levels once you actually understand combat, but also it pushes you to tank because it makes everyone have advantage against you. The rage changes weird, it's, it's a weird change, but it does give you stuff to do outside of combat. It gives you like a bunch of skills that you're gonna be inherently better at because you roll with strength, so... I guess? I can't complain. I like all changes. Yippee! Yoo-hoo! Boy, I sure hope that I like all the changes in all the classes. Bard. This is suitably... You know... For Bard. Bard was a pretty powerful class in 5e, so the changes to it are way less dramatic than with Barbarian. Dramatic, because... It's a joke on Bard. Please remark on my witticisms in the comments below. The biggest change to it is to Bardic Inspiration, which is now much more integral to the class. It lasts an hour now in new book as opposed to the 10 minute weird length it had in old book. One hour is great to slap on someone and send them to do whatever you need them to do that you can't do yourself, which as a bard isn't much. Bardic Inspo then gets even more love with ways to turn spell slots into Bardic Inspo and getting new uses of Bardic Inspo when you roll for initiative without having any uses left. Bardic Inspo is one of the few class resources that refreshes entirely on a short rest and not on a long rest, which is the new norm in New Book. All in all, I'm okay with this. It emphasizes the bard's unique ability to make it feel bardier, which, good. A change I don't love at all is no rapiers. No rapiers for bard. What are you talking about? No rapiers for bard? You kick the bard? I get why, even if the class identity is being the jack of all trades, you don't want them to be literally good at everything. And combat subclasses like the College of Valor get access to all martial weapons, but still, I don't know, this is the biggest debuff we've found yet, and I don't think it was that necessary. But the bard is my favorite, so I would think that. Besides the big changes to bardic inspo, a new interesting change is that a lot of the baked-in musical flavor of the class is completely gone, on account of like stuff like Song of Rest being gone, and two out of the four subclasses that you get in the PHB being not related to music at all. This might be a hot take, but I'm okay with this. It gives people that do not understand that you can't play a bard without singing at the table more of a chance to play the class. There's nothing in the class text that demands you be Sam Regal when playing a bard. Magical Secrets gets also a massive change. Instead of getting two spells, you can now pick any spell from any spell list after level 10. Massive buff. The builds for this are gonna be wild. I can just feel it. And finally, and I just have to talk about this, you get Power Word Heal and Power Word Kill prepared forever, and when you cast them, you can select an additional creature to be affected. Bards had no capstone to speak of, and now they get one of the best capstones in the game. So, net win! I forgore. They fixed counter charm to be actually useful now. I hated counter charm before so much. Flames! On the side of my face. Oh, also Dancing Bard. I did one of those. Not a change though, so I'm not covering it. Subclasses wise, not much of a change. Glamour gets a boost, which it sorely needed, pushing it more towards charming and healing. College of Lore continues to be one of the best subclasses for the Bard on account of having one of the best uses for inspiration, but they did get a little bit of a nerf to their magical secrets because magical secrets changed for the Bard. But just like Bear, this one also needed a nerf, so cool. And finally, College of Valor is now amazing by virtue of it going full gish, allowing you to replace one of your attacks with a casting a cantrip. Oh, and giving you martial weapons, and the illustration has a rapier to upset me and mock me. All in all, the changes are not as exciting as Barbarian, but Bard didn't need that much of a tweak. It still feels like the Bard from 5e, which is great because I still get to annoy, uh, I mean, help my party by playing a Bard, which I love. Moving on. Cleric. I own exactly one white shirt. 
Kirk is my favorite class along with Bard, and they have certainly done more changes than to Bard, so let's see what they've done now that we've let them cook. Right out of the gate, no subclass at level 1. That's right, all classes get their subclass at level 3, clerics included. I'll give my thoughts about this in a minute, but what you need to understand for retro compatibility purposes, so to use subclasses from older books, is that what you got at level 1, you now get at level 3. That's it, easy. The through line for cleric changes is that they have fully embraced that a cleric can either be a fully caster only caster magic-y guy, or a melee combatant that also casts spells. And, rejoice, they have finally decoupled this from subclasses, like formally, not just a Tasha thing. You get to pick if you want to be a full caster or a melee spell caster, regardless of your subclass. Trickery can now stop crying because of the poison damage. Praise be. The first feature of Cleric really emphasizes this choice. You basically get to choose between Protector, which gives you armor and martial weapons, or Thaumaturge, which gets you an extra cantrip and makes you better at Arcata checks and Sunday school. Channel Divinity is now one of those weird class resources where you only get one use every short rest. I don't want to say I hate this, but I definitely have to try this. I'm not convinced. In terms of major changes, Destroy Undead is replaced by Seer Undead, like a stake. It basically works exactly like the sleep spell, with you rolling a bunch of d8s to deal damage to undead, instead of the CR of undead mess they did before. I like this way better, it's easy. And it scales way better with levels, so hooray! Potent spellcasting and divine strike are now class features, not subclass features, so praise be. You get to pick between one or the other, and there's mention on how to deal with older subclasses before new book, so backwards compatible. Great. Other small changes are Divine Intervention being much more codified, so it's less Ask Your DM and more You Get the Free Cast of a Spell. There's also an improvement to your potent spell casting or your Divine Strike, and you get a brand new capstone which allows you to... Cast Wish? I am begging you from my soul. I'm really digging this let's give everyone a nuke at level 20 approach to class making. Like, why should paladins get to have all the fun? For subclasses, not much to say. Light and life remain basically the same. I have never heard of someone that loves these, but if you do, congrats! War Domain gets some minor tweaks. The biggest one is allowing you to still use your bonus action to attack with a melee weapon if you use your action for something else, you know, like healing you should be doing as a cleric, even though you're a war domain cleric. Trickery, the most fun one, everyone's favorite, has only gotten buffs, and really big buffs at that. Their spell list, which was amazing, has seen some minor tweaks, but not many changes. Blessing of the Trickster has seen a massive buff, lasting until the next long rest. Insane! And your duplicity at level 17 has seen another massive buff, because it grants advantage not just to you, but to all your friends if they stand next to it. Oh, and also the duplicity heals people when it's dissipated. They were definitely aware that this was a fan favorite. As for my opinion, the subclass at level 3 thing is weird. Like, I get why they did it. It homogenizes the whole process. You don't have, like, people with a subclass and people without a subclass. It's easier for newbies, but in fiction, it's weird. You're worshipping a specific god and you don't get those aspects at level 1. It's strange. I don't hate it. I understand why they did it. I'm allowed to say that I don't like it. Other than that, I like it. I like how centered it is on the choice between spellcasting cleric and martial cleric. I like the changes to channel divinity. I like the new trickery. It's cool. I hope... Oh man, I sure hope all classes are like these. Which one is next? Oh. Oh no! Druid. I bought this for a Tom New costume. Druid is the hardest class to play in 5e. It's clunky, it's complicated, it has a thousand different toys on its kit, and it's the bane of every DM. Let's see how they fix that, right? So Druids are clerics now. Okay, just like clerics, you get to pick if you're a magic -y druid or a melee hitting druid. The melee gets you martial weapons and medium armor, and the magic -y one gets you an extra cantrip and are just really good at arcana checks and boy scout missions. Just like clerics! Yay! Also just like clerics, you get to pick if you want extra melee damage or extra cantrip damage, and this gets later on improved by an ability. Just like clerics, the biggest change, I do mean the biggest change, is to wild shape. Wild shape is... Just as complicated as it was in the old book, but worse! You're still supposed to carry a thousand stab blocks with you, except... Hold on to your granola! You keep your normal HP. That's right, tank druid is done! No more wild shape tanking. So why, oh god why, do you need to carry 30 stab blocks with you? This legit mystified me so much that I had to ask Jeremy Crawford about it. Druid has seen the highest amount of changes in North Arcana. I personally quite liked its first iteration and the simplicity it gave to a very complicated class, and it seems like those changes were walked back and the Druid is now way more similar than the 5e one. What's the reason behind that? In the new book, it's simpler than what is in 5e, but not as simple as that first North Arcana. 
During the D&D Next process over 10 years ago, we also presented a druid that had sort of a simple set of uh, wild shape options. And the resounding feedback we got then was, no, 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 let us keep using stat blocks. So then we decided, well, we'll try again. <laughs> and this time the, the feedback was actually closer to sort of almost being, you know, an equal split, but the stat block side was still winning. Now we actually still considered uh, with that feedback going in the simple template direction. The reason ultimately we landed with continuing with the stat blocks are part of it was there was a, a bit of a majority of people who wanted that direction, but actually more importantly, it was actually about preserving the play experience that people expect in the fifth edition version of the game. Because this is an evolution of fifth edition rather than a, a departure from it, we essentially wanted to do everything we could do to improve the Druid play experience, giving new options, but also preserving that core experience that so many Druid fans enjoy of, ooh, what cool beast can I turn into? So yeah! Just like in the beginning of 5e, where every fighter was gonna get maneuvers and different subclasses will give you different maneuvers, they tried to fix the druid's clunkiness and people complained and feedback came back negative and now we're here. Again, in this druidic hell. There was a UA, UA is an Earth Arcana, it's basically a specific place to play test D&D content where you got stat blocks, baseline stat blocks that had no specific animal attached to them, but you had like a flying one or a swimming one or a burrowing one. And you get to pick whatever flavor that is. If you want the swimming one to be an octopus one time and a shark the next one, that's fine. You use the same stat block and it was so good and people reply negatively to that and now we're here again i guess that wasn't good enough so now you still carry 30 stat blocks but you don't tank anymore and for the record i completely agree with the not tanking every broken build was a moon druid it had to change especially when you got infinite uses of wild shape what were you gonna do at that point never die but i mean who am i getting mad here they did try to fix it and it is not 6e it's still the same edition so I understand what he means. They don't want to change the Druid completely. As much as I wish they did. The rest of the changes to Druid are way less controversial. You're gonna be okay with this. You can always be a Disney princess. You regain new uses of wild shape by turning spell slots into wild shape uses. You gain new uses of wild shape if you roll initiative and you don't have any left, which replaces unlimited wild shape, which thank God. And also summoning is fixed. The evil is defeated. Oh, and you can still access the mystical magical powers of nature Botox to never age. Hooray. The weirdest, weirdest addition is giving Druid a familiar, which was a Tasha thing that I saw and probably ignored. And apparently that's class baseline now. I'm sure that Druids needed another thing to play with in their arsenal. They didn't have enough stab blocks. Of course, with these massive changes, Druid subclass has got all a massive overhaul. All of them are different. Land Druids now are super versatile. They let you choose a different land at the end of a long Mimir, which great. Moon Druid is completely different now, which it sure needed a change. It felt like every broken Reddit build was a Moon Druid. It still feels like the moon, although it's way more spellcasting. Circle of the Stars didn't change at all because it's the best Druid subclass and I love it so goddamn much and it was perfect from the start and I'm very objective in this assessment. And Circle of the Sea, the new one, is just Circle of Spores, but with an anime beach episode like overlaid on top of it. Okay, all in all, gotta say, disappointed. I wish this had completely changed. I wish it wasn't this. I understand all the changes and why they did it. I just wish that Druid was easier to play and easier to manage because it's such a staple of fantasy that so many newbies come to the table being like, I wanna play a Druid and you put it in front of them and you feel like a monster. <laughs> it is strange that it somehow feels more complicated because now it has a familiar on top of it. Okay, great. <laughs> and they play like clerics now, which I get a little bit of homogenization, but I don't know. I wish that UA was real. Anyway, fighter. Is this stolen valor? My American veteran friend told me it was okay. We got it at Goodwill. And uh, apparently it's not in use anymore, so it's fine. Probably okay. Okay, so the fighter doesn't get really massive changes, except it does, because weapons are the best thing about the new PHB, and the fighter gets to showcase them fully. You start with three weapon masteries, and you gain more as you level up. What does this mean? Well, you know how before, in old book, new weapons basically meant nothing, like there wasn't any significant difference between them other than the type of damage that they dealt, and whether they had, like, 
the light property. Now, in New Book, every weapon has an ability that happens when you hit with it. And they go from slowing someone's speed, dealing damage even if you miss with that weapon, and 5,000 other things. You know what this is, right? It's maneuvers. It's maneuvers again. This whole PHP is maneuvers. We're finally getting standardized maneuvers for melee fighters, and I could not be happier about this. Fighters get the most weapon masteries out of every class, and they gain more as they level up. You can even choose different actions if you have a weapon mastery and you hit with that weapon as you level up. The level at which fighters have become so much more tactical with this change is insane. I'm not even waiting until the end of this little section to tell you how excited I am about this. I love this. This might be my favorite change. The other Another big change to fighters is Second Wind, which is now a class resource like Bardic Inspiration. You can use Second Wind to heal yourself like you did before, but you can also use it to move up to half of your speed without provoking attacks of opportunity or reroll ability checks. And, and yeah, why not? A little bit more complexity is not gonna kill the fighter, but it's certainly gonna let you do more things, especially outside of combat. It's great! And that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, and you can't use Action Surge to cast spells. I'm sure no one's gonna miss that. In the Subclass-wise, everyone gets massive changes. Batter Master gets a skill on top of their tool proficiency, which means you might actually use this one, and also know your enemy doesn't take one minute of you staring at an enemy outside of combat, just a bonus action, which is a buff, even if the effects of it are nerfed. Relentless is completely different and also way better. It allows you to not burn through your superiority dice, which, great. And also, a bunch of maneuvers are different. They basically nerf the massive, massive ones that you must take. As for the others, Champion can finally kind of stand up to Metal Master by getting advantage on every first attack of every turn. Insane. And also getting all their good things way earlier. Eldritch Knight can use any school of magic now, which, great. Why was that there? And also they can change one of the attacks in their attack action by a cantrip. Great. Spellblade. They really are standardizing all these Gish subclasses. Good. Oh yeah, and Psy Warrior is now there, and nothing has changed, and remains exactly the same. Good job. Bye-bye. All in all, if you take the second win as a class resource thing out, fighters remain basically unchanged. If it wasn't for weapon masteries, and weapon masteries are the best thing about this book. So fighters have changed a lot, and it's great. I kept complaining about how fighters need maneuvers, and I wish that every fighter got maneuvers, and this is basically a baby version of that, and I love it so much. It even helps the fighter with their flavor problem. Fighters are now weapon experts, and they kind of already Already were, but now it actually matters in gameplay, and I love that. It's such a good implementation of what a fighter is. A plus change across the board, weapon masteries are my favorite thing about this book, and speaking of cool changes, I'm getting worse at segues as time goes on. Monk. It's like a sports thing, like monk training. You get it. Monks have changed a lot, and I'm sure there's already 5,000 videos on the changes to abilities, but there's something very interesting to me, and it's the changes to flavor. They've changed the flavor of Monk completely. No more key points, no more wuxia coding. The bones are the same, but the East Asian coding aesthetic is completely gone. I had to ask Jeremy why. Monks seem to have changed the most. There are a lot of mechanical changes, but I want to focus on a flavor change that I find super interesting. They seem to be less defined by a specific culture overall. What was the design reason behind that change? As we looked at each class and not only looked at the core class, but also the four subclasses that would help express that class, we were always looking for a quartet of subclasses that would not only present different gameplay options, but also different aesthetics. The monk had really grown out of its sort of previous aesthetic and really needed to occupy a broader territory, a territory that's all about whatever the sort of cultural flavor, someone who is amazing at unarmed combat, almost supernatural self-discipline, and is using the combination of their abilities to pull off just extraordinary feats. It was really about an effort across the board with our classes. A number of these explorations we started in books like Xanathar's Guide and Tasha's, uh -huh. and the New Player's Handbook is an opportunity for us to take mm -hmm. a lot of those explorations and now now codify them in in the main rulebook of the mm -hmm. game. It broadens what a monk can be, but it doesn't exclude what a monk was. Exactly. In my opinion, good. I literally said in the monk video that the aesthetic coding of monk narrowed what people thought that a monk could be or a monk could look like. 
If you go by all the art and all the flavor of that class, you might not even think about making a monk that is a bare knuckled boxer, but that can very much be a monk. Like that can be a monk character that you can make. And now that is way more obvious for people. As it was said in the interview, you can still make your martial arts wuxia coded monk. You can just do that and other things easier. I like it. It's more options. So in terms of abilities, the monk is completely different. It is the class that has changed the most. The big through line here is buffs. Buffs everywhere, which yes, good. Monk needed them. Your focus points, that's right, we don't call them key points anymore, allow you to do exactly the same things that you did before, but either better or allow you to do completely different things. Patient defense means you can always disengage as a bonus action, but using a focus point allows you to disengage and dodge at the same time with the same bonus action. So a flat buff. These features get even stronger at level 10, with Flurry of Blows dealing 3 attacks, Patient Defense giving you 10 HP, and Step of the Wind letting you take your friends for a ride when you move extra movement. It's wild. Key points, just like Bardic Inspiration, reset on a short Mimir and not on a long Mimir as it's now the norm, and you get an ability to get them all back when you roll initiative once. So you're not running out of them. And, and, get this, your martial arts die starts at a D6. Praise be. Deflect missiles exist no more, that's right, now you deflect attacks, which means that anything that deals normal damage, like slashing, bludgeoning, blah 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 blah, you can deflect and parry to deal more attacks. And later on, this turns into deflect energy, which means you can deflect any sort of attack. Stunning Strike gets a buff, you can gain resistance to all damage except force for one minute, you still get the fun flavor ability like Timeless Body and the new ones like Self Restoration, and at level 20, you get your own version of the Barbarian Capstone with Dex and Wisdom, which are the best stats in D&D, increasing by 4 to a maximum of 25. It's great. Subclasses now are not called Way of the Whatever, and now are called Warrior of the Whatever. I guess this is a change for the flavor thing? I think it was fine before. It's a shame that the subclass illustrations- Oh, by the way, all subclasses get illustrations. I don't think I mentioned that. Isn't that insane? The art is beautiful in this book. But all the subclass illustrations for Monk still have a very East Asian coding to them. I wish they had gone completely wild with some of these, like give us a fisticuffs Monk. Warrior of Mercy gets a really cool Plague Doctor mask, but it's also weirdly enough nerfed across the board. I never thought that Way of Mercy was particularly powerful, but I guess, I, I to be honest, I'm not particularly taken by this. Warrior of Shadow has been reflavored to be Tai 2. The Shadow fell. <laughs> and is now even more of a ninja. And Warrior of the Open Hand has lost the I touch you and you die ability. F. Just kidding. I'm glad that it doesn't have that. But it was very funny. I think the internet agrees that this is a good iteration of the monk, and I agree with the internet. I like this monk. If you go to my monk video, you will see that my critiques were that it needed more damage, and that the class identity was very much there, but it was aesthetically narrow. And they have addressed both of those concerns, so... I'm a happy camper. They brought on the class fantasy and its aesthetics, and they made it a stronger combatant. So I think that that's all the concerns that we had. I have no complaints. I wonder if all classes will be this married to their original class fantasy. Tint hint, nudge nudge, paladin. I feel like blue and white are like paladin colors. Does that make sense? Paladin feels like it has gotten a lot of changes, but when you get down to it, it's more confusing than that. This one is the first one I've found confusing to parse, so I'll try to explain it clearly. The biggest change is Divine Smite, which has gotten a lot of changes, except no, except yes, except a little bit. Let me explain. Basically, it's now a spell, but it works exactly as it did before, except you use a bonus action and it's not just part of your attack action, which means you get one Divine Smite per turn. Mystifying why this needed a change, Divine Smite was extremely powerful, but I didn't feel like Paladins were outpacing everyone in damage. What Paladins are really good at is at going Nova, which means using all of their abilities at one go for amazing damage. But this is what I will say, we have to be more careful about classes that are really good at going Nova because D&D was conceived as a game where you had nine combat encounters between long rests and it just isn't that. Barely anyone plays it that way anymore. So I understand why this is this way. I understand the nerf to one Divine Smite a turn. Why the spell though? The spell part of it just feels like a more confusing version of what was there before, and the Divine Smite once per turn feels like it might be a little bit too much of an overcorrection for me. I don't know, I'll have to see. Another example of Paladins feeling like they've got more changes, but it just being gradual changes is spellcasting. Spellcasting has changed, you get spells at level one now, but it's the slower progression, so you just get access to them earlier. And that's true across all half casters. You also prepare fewer spells, which takes focus away from the spellcasting aspect of the class, which kind of makes sense because these guys also get weapon masteries. 
You know how I feel about weapon masteries. Auras have also been tweaked, very minor. You can only benefit from one aura at a time, which good, because it could get insane if you had two paladins at the party or God forbid three. Other than that, small changes to lay on hands and less uses of channel divinity, but more chances to use it, which I like better. Weirdest change, the one I want to really highlight is horses. Paladins get to cast Find Steed once for free every long rest, which means you summon an ethereal horse. It's something. Real talk, I see what they're going for here. They want more of that knight flavor to Paladin. And it's just one ability that lets you cast one spell a day for free. It's not changing like completely the flavor of the class. And I'm very interested and, and very intrigued by the thought of a subclass really zeroing on this, like the Knight Templar subclass. I'm okay with that. I want to see more of that. I like this because it's easy to ignore. But also, you can do something fun with it. Paladin subclasses have really, really taken a shift. I had to check, but in old book, you also get your subclass at level 3, so it isn't that wild of a change. And it kind of just made me realize that it makes as much sense as clerics getting their subclass at level 3, so... Okay. I and mean, I still don't love it, but... Interesting to think about. Devotion has really taken a buff, like basically all of the PHP old book subclasses, which good, they needed it. Totem Barbarian is an outlier and should not be counted. All of the ability changes make it feel much more about its theme, Devotion, so I'm on board. Glory gets a slight buff and feels like much more of a good guy than before. It's a shame because I really like the asshole pilot thing they had going on. Ancients is getting a nerf. Praise be, I'm so glad. They no longer get resistance to all damage from spells, but rather a thousand resistances, which still makes them extremely strong, but but it's better. They get resistance to Necrotic, Psychic, and Radiant. If that sounds broken, can't wait for you to hear what Ancients had before. Also, and this is funny to me, all of the Paladin Capstone abilities that the subclass give you last for 10 minutes, except for Ancients. They really know these guys are overpowered. And finally, Edgelord, I mean, Vengeance is still basically the same. Don't worry, Linkin Park fans, your boy is safe. All in all, weird. This one is really weird. I feel less strongly about the changes to Smite because I think that we really have to be more careful about Novas in D&D as encounters get few and far between between long rest as the game just evolves naturally. I just understand why they did it. I'm wondering if it's an overcorrection. We shall see. Oh, and the addition of I cast horse is also weird, but weird in a fun, flavorful way that is also very easy for you to ignore, so I don't hate it. I'm interested. I'm still thinking about that horse subclass. I, I, I want it. I want that horse subclass. Ranger. This is definitely stolen valor. Not really. I was a Boy Scout before. I guess not a US one. Also, this is a child's L. You got some big kids in Utah. So Rangers, I've gotten an update, and the internet had some thoughts on it. And I'm just gonna come out and say it off the bat, I agree with the general sentiment of this being a massive downgrade in terms of flavor. But also, I cannot bring myself to care because Ranger is my least favorite class by a mile, and I've always found that they were extremely lacking and confused in their flavor. Now that you know where I'm coming from, let's look at the actual class. The biggest change here is Hunter's Mark. It's now basically the core of the class, but it's still a spell. It's not a class ability. Is this why y'all did this to Divine Smite? Oh! I get it. Confusing, but I guess it's homogenous. Okay, consistency. Your Haunter's Mark evolves to deal more damage. You can cast it for free a number of times that goes up in levels. You can't lose concentration on Haunter's Mark. I have heard it said that this should come earlier. It's a level 13, kind of high, but also you get to cast this thing like five times for free without using a spell slot by then. I think it's not that bad. It's all about Haunter's Mark. The other changes are basically everything in Tasha and scrubbing it of all the flavorful abilities that you use the grand total of three times per campaign unless you build the campaign around the range. I've already spent a long time about this and I have more to say, so let's quickly go through subclasses. Beastmaster is now basically a Pokemon trainer, like the optional rule is now the rule for the subclass. This plainly works better, especially around death, but it loses the whole I tame beast from the wild by making it a Pokemon. It's fine. Fae Wanderer stays basically the same thing, probably because it's the Tasha book, Tasha best book. Gloomstalker has seen its flavor shift from the Underdark to the Shadowfell. <laughs> It feels very similar to its prior iteration, except Dread Ambusher has gotten a little bit of a redesign. I like it, it's fine. Hunter has lost options, but it has gained the ability to switch between options every long rest, which, good, more adaptable, makes it feel more rangery. Wish the whole class was like that. Okay, I have 
many thoughts on the ranger and i have no time to say them all here i made a whole video about them go watch that if you're interested but basically here's the crux of it the ranger has a massive identity problem and while this redesign makes it stronger as a combatant as in it deals more damage there's just no debate about that it further makes it even less of a defined identity as a class because the ranger doesn't have a clear class identity it doesn't have a precise class fantasy that everyone can agree with this is exemplified by the comments that i get saying no the ranger is this and they're all different from one another it's hazy and means different things to everyone. Until D&D doesn't decide to pick a clear fantasy for the ranger to embody, this will keep happening. My humble proposal, make it an MMO pet class. Make it all about its companion. Make different subclasses have different companions that change their abilities. Drake Warden, Swarm Keeper, Beast Masters, all of these are already that, and people love them. Well, people love Drake Warden and Swarm Keeper. Beastmaster! <laughs> am I disappointed in this? Yeah, I am. But the baseline 5e ranger was aimless and flavorless to me. This is not a shock to me. Much like how they couldn't change the druid completely because this is still 5e, I'm guessing that they thought the same thing for the ranger. A shame! Rogue. I couldn't think of anything but a black hoodie for this. Okay, nice palette cleanser after the ranger. I can already tell you I love the new rogue. Rogue is a tough position because it's the class that attracts the edgiest amongst us, but it's also one of the easiest classes to play, and we can't let the edgelords know that or they'll stop playing. I call this the Rogue Paradox. The new design respects it, but definitely gives the rogues way more to do. The biggest, biggest change to Rogue is their new ability, Cunning Strike. And I... Love it! Cutting Strike is here to shift rogues from glass cannons to skill monkeyism, which it's what they are, but they were also glass cannons. But, keyword here, but they don't stop them from being glass cannon. It's your choice. Basically, whenever you deal sneak attack, you can unleash the fury of the edge, or you can take away one of those d6s from your sneak attack and do something else, inflict an additional effect. You know what I'm gonna say, right? It's maneuvers! It's maneuvers again! They're giving everything maneuvers and I couldn't be happier. I feel so vindicated. Complaining in the fighter video worked. Your baby rogue maneuvers go from inflicting the poison condition, tripping a target to make it prone, or moving away without using your movement or a bonus action. And you get more of these, more maneuvers as you level up. And at one point, you can deal more than one per attack. All of these exchange damage from utility in the fight, but if you're new and you don't know what's going on, or you need big damage, or you don't need big damage, but you want big damage, or you just like the rogue before, you can still do exactly the same. It's just more choices, way more choices. I love it! It's an extra option, not a replacement. The rest of the changes are quite small. Some optional abilities become core abilities like Steady Aim, you get Reliable Talent way earlier, and at one point, you get Wisdom and Charisma saves. Like, proficiency in those? What? Okay, insane. And you get a massive, massive buff to your capstone. Once again, really loving this. We're giving nukes to everyone at level 20 approach to class making. Like, unironically, I really like it. As for subclasses, Arcane Trickster, like Eldritch Mind, can learn spells from any school. Praise be, who cared about this? Your little invisible hand gets a buff in that it can do more with a bonus action, but a debuff in that it can only do sleight of hands checks. This restriction is silly, no one cares about this. You're not gonna tell a player that they can't use their hand to pull a lever. But you get some fun interactions with the hand and Cunning Strike, which I like. Cunning Strike is the maneuvers thing. Assassin is better now in that it's useful in more situations than the three super niche situations it used to be better at before, but it's worse at those specific situations. This is healthy for the game. Assassin was useful in like three cases. Good. It's also very poison heavy, which scares me because there's so many monsters that are resistant to poison now, but maybe the new monster manual will change that, which would be good generally. Soul Knife, the anime subclass, is now PHP. Weeb's Rejoice. It gets buffed in the strangest way in that now you can speak to animals, but you get a weapon mastery, which means I love it. Thief gets some cunning strike interaction, which I love, and also it gets much more thiev and much more about the fantasy of playing a thief. It gets some insane interactions with magic items. Really cool buff. I like the thief a lot more now, and I used to love the thief. Next up, Sorcerer. It's night time now. In my head, the Sorcerer caller is Maroon. I don't know. Maybe it's a blood thing. Sorcerer is one of my favorite classes mechanics-wise and one of my least favorite classes flavor-wise, so let's see how they do. Also, extremely stupid side note, this might be my favorite class illustration that they have. I just... 
Camp. Look at that hair. Incredible. Also, she's wearing my room, so I might be right about the color thing. Sorcerer gets very few tweaks, but one is exciting for the future, and the other one is exciting for right now because it makes them way more playable. The exciting for the future one is called Innate Sorcery. You basically go through like a magical girl transformation sequence and become extremely powerful for one minute. I'm talking your spell DC going up by one? Insane. Oh, and you also get advantage to spell attacks, so... Wild. Also, this feature becomes stronger at level 20, and you gain the ability to get another use of it by consuming sorcery points at level 7. So they're building it into the class pretty thoroughly. What I find interesting is you don't get a single mention of it in any other ability and in none of the subclasses, which feels strange. It feels like there could be a subclass that is based all around this weird innate sorcery transformation. Kind of like the horse paladin thing. I'm kind of picturing, like, magical girl sorcerer. I don't know. I, that is pinging in my brain as something I would like to do. The other change that makes sorcerers much more playable, at least to me, because I've always had this issue with them, is they get a baby version of arcane recovery, but for sorcery points. I always found it super wild that people kept complaining about monks running out of key, but not doing the exact same thing for sorcerers, because to me, that's my experience of playing a sorcerer. Probably it's because they get normal spells lock progression, so you can do something else, whereas the monk can't. Anyway, this does fix that, or I don't know if I would go as far as saying it fixes it, but it definitely makes it better. The other cool change is the enormous amount of meta magic options that they have added. This makes the Sorcerer one of the most customizable classes, not as far as Warlock, and we'll get to that, but pretty customizable. And to be honest, meta magic might be my favorite class ability. I absolutely love it, so more options for it. I'm down. Careful spell is easier to understand. Extended spell gets a buff by giving you advantage on concentration saves. Heightened spell and seeking spell cost less to cast, which good, means someone might use those more than once. Subtle spell gets a buff that everyone was already using. And quicken spell and twin spell get nerfed. Boo! Boo! No! Kaka! No kaka! Quicken spell doesn't allow you to cast two level spells in the same turn. And twin spell can only be used in spell that you upcast, so no twin fireballs. I don't know, was this necessary? I don't pay attention to power builds, but I bet it's that. For subclasses, you also get these at level 3, and... Clockwork Soul gets basically no changes. Best book times 2. Draconic Sorcery gets massive spells, and it's just more dragon-y all around, so... Dragon lovers rejoice! And don't hurt me. The one with the most changes is Wild Magic, and that's a community favorite, so... <laughs> let's see. Most changes are unremarkable except for one. The Wild Magic table is noticeably shorter. They're pairing up three numbers instead of two now. If I had to guess, they probably want a tighter leash on design. Like, it doesn't take more work to copy the Wild Magic table as it is. As a matter of fact, it takes more work to change it, so... There probably is a reason. I've never played Wild Magic, nor will I ever, so I cannot tell you that reason, but, you know, I'm telling you, it's, it's changed. I do have one critique. They messed up the reference. They messed up the reference to the Hitchhiker's Guide. The potted plan doesn't happen at 4142. Fix it. Fix it. Literally unplayable. Fix it right now or we riot. Uh, do people even know that that's a reference? Comment below. Comment below if you have read book. I realize that maybe sorcery points going too fast might be a problem just for me, but I I'm very happy that I get more uses of I can do whatever I want magic. Good job. Maybe it'll make me ignore the flavor and play more sorcerers. We'll get into it in the sorcerer video. A and speaking of classes we've made a video for... Warlock. Is this too transparent? No. You know how to bust out the horns for this one. I just did a video on Warlocks, and my biggest problem with them is the death grip that Eldritch Blast has on the class. Let's see if this has fixed that! Spoiler alert, yes it has. Yes it has, kinda, sorta, but a little bit, but I'm so happy, I'm so happy. I'm gonna try to not immediately talk about Eldritch Blast and concentrate on the other abilities first, because there are not many changes. The most important one is that you gain way more Eldritch Invocations way quicker. You get one at level one, not really, we'll talk about it. And by level five, you have five instead of three. And at level 20, you get 10 Eldritch Invocations instead of eight. Way more and much quicker. Multiclassers are gonna have a field day with this. Pack boons also are now invocations, which means you can get more than one. Isn't that crazy? I'm sure that there's a build with talisman that makes sense. Maybe. The whole weirdness with spell slots is still here, and they haven't given warlocks more spell slots, which I think is silly. Like, downright goofy at this point. I think it's insane that warlocks have to go with two spell slots until level 11 where they get three. Especially when designers have acknowledged that people are not short resting as much as they thought they would. Like it's not working, <laughs> give them more. They have tried to offset this by giving you a way to recover half of your spell slots in one minute once per long rest. Baby's first arcane recovery. This might sound good 
until you realize once again that until level 11 you have two spell slots which means this is a way to gain back one of them one spell slot and you only get to do this once per long rest thanks would it have killed them to do two spell slots? I don't know, more than half? Oh, and one tiny change that they have added and I really like is that Warlocks have now a direct line of communication with their patron at a certain level, which I think is great because normally DMs had to engineer a way for that to happen and now it's on the hands of the Warlock and that's good. Good job. Have fun butt dialing Cthulhu. Okay, I've danced around it long enough. Eldritch Blast, have they fixed it? Kinda, I like it. But kinda. Warlocks are extremely reliant on Eldritch Blast, which means if you want to build an optimal Warlock, you're gonna take every Eldritch Invocation that empowers Eldritch Blast. So all this, Warlocks are all different, ends up not being true. And they have addressed this! Every single Invocation that makes Eldritch Blast better can now be used with any damaging cantrip. Good! Is that a complete fix? Not really. This is definitely not a fix for the spell slot thing, but I think that this, in conjunction with them getting a ton more Eldritch Invocations, is gonna lead to actually different Warlocks. Like, we're gonna see some Toll the Dead Warlocks. Definitely. I talked way too much about this. They've cut down a bunch of Eldritch Invocations, like, a lot of them. Most of the you get a spell for free are completely done, which means the spell problem is more of a problem, but, 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 this does make way easier to parse. Like, the whole invocation list is way smaller, which I was always intimidated by the size of that thing. On to subclasses. Archfey Patron is now Misty Step, the subclass. It's all around Misty Step. I liked Archfey Patron the best out of the flavor and the worst out of the mechanics. So I like this better, but it definitely is weird. Celestial Patron gets buffed all around. It definitely feels like the support warlock now. Okay, it feels more celestial. Fiend Patron. Mentions. Night Hacks! Hack gang, let's go! Everything basically gets above. Spells are better, Dark One's Blessing no longer encourages the Warlock to steal kills, and then basically everything gets above. Also, they keep the I touch you and send you to hell ability, which is just as funny as before, but they did nerf the damage, which... Good. And finally, Cthulhu Daddy is leaning super hard on the psychic side of things. Like, really hard. Down to giving psychic damage to spells. Like, spells that didn't have psychic damage can now be turned into psychic damage for a sort of, like, meta magic slash order of scribes kind of thing. In general, I find it much more flavorful. Tentacle people are eating good tonight. All in all, good on them for finally addressing the Eldritch Blast thing. I don't think that this completely fixes it, but it definitely makes it better. I really don't like that they're married to this, like, dearth of spell slots thing, and I don't like that they haven't addressed the class's need for short rest in a game that doesn't have as many as they designed it for. But whatever. Last one. Wizard. It's a robe and round glasses. Studious. Get it? They can't all be winners. I can't tell if I like the wizard art better or the sorcerer one better. It might be the wizard. I think it's so sick. So the changes to wizard are few and far between and not that impressive. Good, finally a quick section means I can moan more about subclasses. The biggest thing they're going for is the ability to switch prepare spells on the fly, which, fantastic. If anyone needed this, it's wizards, because, you know, they're the studious one. It makes sense why they would get this. You also get one expertise in one of the wizard skills, which also makes sense. You know, they got their PHB, they're gonna let everyone know anything they can about botany. Makes sense. Anyway, you can pick Arcana or Investigation, it will always come up. The only other change that merits any discussion is that now Spell Mastery can only apply to spells that take a whole action to cast. I would put my hand in the fire to say that this was only done for Misty Step. Let me poof in peace. Was this necessary? And that's it. That's all the wizard changes. Sometimes when you're doing these massive redesign things, you take one thing as your baseline and you kind of bring everything else to that baseline. I wonder if the wizard was that baseline because there's basically no changes, especially compared to other classes. Especially with how many spellcasting subclasses get a version of Arcane Recovery. Think about it. Anyway, subclasses. The big internet talking point about wizards is that not every school of magic gets its own subclass in this PHP, which I agree, it really sucks. It Wait. Diviner is in this one? Never mind, I don't care. It's the only one I like. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Kind of. Wizard is actually one of those classes that used to get their subclass before level 3, but it was only level 2, and now you get an expertise for a trade, so... I like that better. I'm fine with that. It's gonna be really, really easy to plug in anything. The only change is that the savant abilities of the subclasses related to a school of magic have also changed, so you either use the old ones if you like those ones, or you just compare them to what they did with the new ones and apply those to the other ones. They all follow the exact same formula, it's easy. Actual subclasses now. Abjurer. The one that tanks. And it still tanks! Multiclassers that are trying to make the tank from hell to make all DMs cry are gonna have a field day for this one. They basically get all buffs. Diviner, the best, 
my baby, my little precious son, which was perfect already, gets only one change because it was perfect already. And it's to use their third eye as a bonus action. Buff, but you can't see ghosts. Nerf, but you have more dark vision and actual see invisibility instead of like a weaker version. Buff again. Evoker just switched the orders of two abilities. Okay. And finally, Illusionist is the one that got the biggest changes, and thank god because oh boy were Illusionist the twin that got the least amount of nutrients in the womb. You can cast illusions easier and quicker, and the biggest thing is that you can summon creatures? This is Conjuration. Okay, and finally you can recast your illusory self with spell slots. I was expecting a bigger buff. All in all, it's fine. I like the changing on the fly thing. It's not that many changes, it's kind of like an anticlimactic end. <laughs> okay, good job. Human Familiar, you are dismissed. Huh? Dressing up was fun. And thank you to Jeremy for answering my questions. Great talking right, about you. So, what think? These are the classes I think are better than their original iterations. These are the ones that I feel either neutral about or I have to wait and see. And these are the ones I don't like. Or are the ones that I feel are the biggest missed opportunity. Important to note here, I am the furthest thing away from a ranger or a druid enjoyer. I don't really like those classes as they are, so source that info from veterans of the druid and ranger wars if you want a really deep dive. I hate that I have to do this, but I want to stress this again. Wizards did not pay me to say this. This was not sponsored by them. They're not approving this script. These are my actual thoughts. I I say this again because I sure hope that y'all don't see my actual excitement for some of these things as insincere. I like a ton of stuff in these books. I love this one so much. Sorcerer. This is so cool to me. When I was writing this, I was like, man, should I be more negative about more stuff? But like, what am I gonna do? Lie and say that I don't enjoy something that I enjoy to prove that I'm not lying? I hope my critiques of what I think doesn't work have proven that. <laughs> I'm not scared of saying what I think. I care way more about what the audience that has supported me and helped me even in a time like now where I find myself between day jobs thinks because y'all are the ones actually supporting me in the long run and it'd be stupid for me to break that trust so these are truly my actual thoughts should you buy the new PHB? I don't know buy it if you think it sounds good I know that there are three hour streams on each of these classes but I wanted to give you a highly edited easy to understand flyover view of the whole thing and I hope that was useful. If you want my thoughts, what I can say is that after reading it, God, I don't even know how many times for this video, this was hard, is that this book is made by people that play this game. So many of these changes come from people that have played a barbarian until it got boring, or a fighter that isn't a battle master, or a sorcerer that runs out of sorcery points, or a monk that is a monk. I don't think that this is written cynically by people who have a vague idea of what the dragon game is. And I like that about this book. Also, I'm an artist and what you can always count on me doing is to give the proper props to the fellow artists working in this or any other industry. The art looks sick. This is a really pretty book. You are the customer, you make the final choice. But I hope my video was useful in you making that choice. The original iteration of this video was me going through all the changes ever and that was going to be 90 plus pages of script. Then it was classes and species and that was around 50 plus and now we're here at only classes and it's 19 on a time crunch because of gen con this was hell but let me know if you would like to see a video like this for all the different species in the php did you all know that half elves are gone and half orcs wild i asked jeremy crawford about that too but i just couldn't fit it in this video hope you enjoyed this because i'm taking a break i need a break i'm dying please guys <laughs> believe me i wouldn't do it if i didn't need it so see you on the 23rd of august two weeks without videos i miss y'all just play the videos on loop catch me at gen con if you're watching this my schedule is in the community tab bye bye Mwah.